can't believe you guys kept me waiting for three whole minutes. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. All right, we are live and recording, so you can let in all the people and get started. Oh, that's great. Hey, Airfon, can you also copy t uh, tomorrow's information in the mm. chat just so that we Absolutely. Yes, we'll, we'll, have, do. we'll have it ready? Sure thing. Uh, all right, I, I think, what about let's get started? Sounds good. You guys ready? Okay. Um, Good, af good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to another episode of Chat with Green Aggies. Uh, my name is Meng Mengu. I'm a professor extension specialist in the Department of Horticulture here at College Station. And I have three or four uh, panelists with me today. I'm going to just read it from the, the order of my uh, screen. So Erfang, Erfang is our, uh, Dr. Erfang Lafay is our uh, program specialist on uh, IPM in East Texas in Overton. And our speaker today is uh, Dr. Alan Owens, um, retired professor extension specialist from LSU, now working with two uh, nurseries in, in Louisiana. Miss Laura Miller, uh, our county horticulture agent in Tarrant County. Uh, Miss Doctor, Dr. Becky Bolin, our uh, urban water specialist in the Dallas area. Is Paul with us today? Okay, he Paul. Is, yes, yes ma'am. Our Mr. Paul uh, Winsky, our uh, Harris County uh, horticulture extension specialist, uh, horticulture agent. Uh, so I think that's all. Uh, Dr. Ong, maybe Ong or maybe not, but. Uh, Dr. Ong is also one of our regular um, panelists. Is Dr. Chrissy Seegers with us today? She is unable to join us for was... webinar today. Okay, all right. So I'm going to turn the uh, um, the you know the stage to uh, Dr. Alan Owens. Alan, you want to take over? Uh, share your screen. Alan has been a, a very regular uh, speaker, you know, around the, uh, the Southeast. Uh, you know, he has been working in extension for a very, very long time. Uh, just has been doing all kinds of landscape horticulture re uh, related uh, presentations. And today he's gonna share with us, you know, some of the uh, landscape mistakes to, uh, to avoid, you know, from an uh, industry standpoint. Alan, go ahead. Okay, everyone, uh, good afternoon. Uh, appreciate uh, being here with y'all again. Uh, we, uh, we had a program a couple of months ago where I kind of uh, started addressing uh, this issue with some of the, the landscape mistakes and some of the landscape cultural practices that we need to keep in mind when we're uh, out there working with, our, uh, working with our jobs and in our job sites and working with our clients. So we're gonna just kind of uh, go through some of that information again, and I've added a few uh, new um, new things to talk about. So uh, appreciate everybody being here today. It looks like we have 49 participants, so that's good. Let's see if I can advance my slides here. And I'm not sure why they're not advancing. Mm, maybe maybe your there, final there, Yeah, it's going. There it's it going. I, I think the, the temperature may have been very <laughs> low, you know, that, that may have explained it. Yes. My computer should have thought out by now. So anyway. Yes. But we're uh, but we're gonna talk about pruning, and I think that's a really important topic right now because uh, as all of you all who are in the industry know. In the, last, uh, in the last week, we've had uh, major cold, so everybody's asking about pruning, but we're gonna talk about pruning a little bit. And you still see uh, pruning paint and wound dressing being used, and that's really not recommended anymore, so we're gonna talk about that. Uh, we're gonna go over the uh, mulching information again and a little bit of the uh, insect considerations that we need to be thinking about, uh, weed management, and then, uh, and then maybe the next topic is not a a whole Texas issue, but it's certainly a 
uh, uh, three plants that are very common in East Texas and Northeast Texas. And just like they are in Louisiana where I am, azaleas and gardenias and camellias and some care information for those plants. Uh, then there's a lot of discussion about tree planting going on. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And then we'll talk some about soil testing and irrigation of uh, water quality, which, uh, which are probably more important than maybe uh, we regularly think about. Okay, so uh, pruning in the landscape, dead, disease, dying, decay, damaged, kind of remember the four or five Ds of pruning. Uh, that's something that you can uh, be referring to and talking to your clients about when you're explaining uh, pruning jobs to them. We really need to be pruning at the right time. And uh, as y'all are dealing with home gardeners, um, uh, try to educate them on why you're pruning this plant at this certain time. Um, we uh, many times, unfortunately, in commercial landscape situations, we're really not pruning at the right time. So let's evaluate all of our pruning practices and prune at the right time of the year to enhance the flowering, to take care of the bark characteristics, to prune the plants in the right way. So they're not gonna be stressed at the time of the year where the plants are already stressed. All those factors uh, need to be considered. Of course, we're pruning to uh, uh, maintain the shape of a tree. Uh, tree pruning uh, when the plants are young, it's very important to get the right structural shape there and get your lateral branches and your radial branch distribution uh, correct. Uh, the fruit and the bark characteristics. And then you get down into the thinning and the topping kind of methods. And uh, most of the time in commercial landscape maintenance now we seem to be topping. So I really would prefer that we have more thinning going on than topping going on. Uh, thinning is gonna give you a more natural look. It's not gonna stress the plants as much. Uh, topping is gonna give your, your landscape more of a formal look. Uh, you may uh, be stressing the plant more because you're taking off more leaf area. You may wind up with a situation where the, the top of the plant is wider than the bottom of the plant is, and that affects the uh, sunlight penetration down to the base of a screen or the base of a hedge. So you need to watch uh, how you're topping and don't do uh, that uh, severely every time. It would be better to, top if you do, prune formally. If you do top, do it more often and slightly instead of less often and severely. Uh, but thinning is, uh, is really the way to do it. Go into the canopy of the plant, take out wood at the point of origin, remove the bypass shoots on your azaleas and other plants, those, those branches that kind of bypass the main body of the plant canopy. Uh, that's what we want to be uh, thinking about. Okay, and this is the uh, classic uh, image from Dr. Shigo on tree pruning. So anytime you have trees and you have branches that are in this uh, two to three inch diameter, we really need to be making these three cuts in this particular order. And uh, a lot of people uh, don't necessarily understand why we do this, but we need to pay attention to where our, our branch collar is there and where our our bark ridge is. And when we're taking off these limbs, we don't want that limb falling off that tree or falling off that large shrub and stripping uh, the bark and stripping the wood off uh, and removing some of that branch collar or that uh, bark ridge there and going down the main trunk because that's going to create a wound that's not going to compartmentalize as well. So you want to do these uh, cuts in the one, two to three order and make a, a nice cut there, clean cut, and uh, leave your branch collar and your bark ridge alone. And that way that that cut can compartmentalize and, uh, and kind of heal over naturally and uh, protect that cut over area from uh, disease infestation, insect, uh, insect populations moving in and uh, protect her from moisture, humidity, rainfall, a uh, fungus developing in there. So a really nice uh, example of compartmentalization on a decent sized limb there. 
Uh, and that's really what you are going to see when you prune a tree correctly. You're going to have that nice ring formed there and wall off that cutover area. And uh, the compartmentalization of decay in trees is what you are seeing in that particular uh, picture in there. And that may take a year or two to develop after you make that pruning cut, but it is going to develop like that if that tree limb is cut off in the right way. And then uh, at garden centers and even in some of the uh, landscape supply stores now, you still still see the uh, wound dressings and the pruning paints and these kind of products being sold. But really the research has shown now, and it's been showing this for 30 years, but these products are still being used, that if you make your pruning cuts correctly, uh, you don't need to be using the wound sealers, wound dressings, pruning paints. Uh, these products actually keep moisture in that cut area. They don't let good air exchange to occur in this cut area. So it actually show, slows down that, that self-healing or that compartmentalization that the tree has the natural, natural uh, capability to do. So try to do away with the uh, wound dressings, wound paints, and the pruning uh, paints that you, uh, that you see uh, available. And then this is what used to be done a whole lot in Louisiana. Of course, we have a lot of uh, old oak trees and they kind of get hollowed out. So there was always this practice to, to go in here and put bricks or cement or concrete in the, in the base of the tree to try to, you know, supposedly give the tree a little bit of support, but uh, we really don't want to be doing uh, this practice either. So I have really not seen this done very much the last 10 years. So it's good to see that most of the arborists and landscape professionals now, you all are, are um, 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 doing tree care uh, the right way. Okay, and then, um, and then the crepe myrtle pruning and, uh, and of course across the Southeast east, uh, uh, there's always a lot of discussion about crepe myrtle pruning. And, uh, and there's a discussion about whether you spell crepe myrtle, C-R-A-P-E or E-P-E. And I know Greg Grant has done several news articles on that and there's disagreement, but really it's no big deal as far as I'm concerned. But, but if you're pruning a crepe myrtle correctly, you're gonna have stronger wood. Uh, you're gonna have more blooms, you're gonna have more flowers. Usually you're gonna have earlier flower formation. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that that crepe myrtle blooms are attractive to many pollinating insects. Uh, you're going to have more pollinating insects on a properly prone crepe myrtle than an improperly prone crepe myrtle. Of course, on uh, Natchez and Basham's Party Pink and Muscogee and some of these crepe myrtles that have really nice bark, you're going to have a much nicer uh, exfoliating bark appearance in the landscape when you prune a crepe myrtle right. And, uh, and when we say pruning crepe myrtles correctly, once again, this is thinning as opposed to topping. Uh, crepe myrtles are very prone to water sprouts and they're very prone to suckers. So uh, water sprouts are the vigorous upright shoots in the main in the canopy and the suckers are those vigorous upright shoots at the base of the plant. And uh, those suckers, they arise from maybe weed eater damage or mechanical damage at the base of the tree. Uh, they come back when there's a stub there and the, you know, when the stub is left too large and, and the sucker growth returns. So, um, uh, so, so kind of watch your water sprouts and watch your suckers. And if you prune right, you're not going to have as many of those. And if you prune those out correctly, as opposed to pruning those out incorrectly, they're not going to come back. So uh, there are several things to keep in mind there. Uh, you're going to have more birds nurse nesting in a, in a properly pruned crepe myrtle tree. Uh, Dr. Alan Wyndham at the University of Tennessee has some very good pictures about uh, fungal decay in the wood of crepe myrtle trees when they're topped as opposed to thin. So there are several different uh, uh, stem funguses that get into the trunks on crepe myrtles when they're topped every year at the same place. So, uh, so you can have uh, stem die back and top die back and trunk die back in, uh, in crepe myrtles. 
uh, when you uh, thin a crepe myrtle, you have a better distribution of the branching and of the foliage and the airspace and the canopy. So you have better air circulation. When you have better air circulation, more sunlight, you're gonna have fewer insects and you're not gonna have the uh, city mold of building up on the, um, on the foliage. So pruning right will lessen uh, those problems. And then with your uh, sarcospora leaf spot and your bacterial leaf spot, uh, when you have a nice uh, properly thinned crepe myrtle, you're gonna have better air circulation. So that once again, cuts down on the leaf spot, just like it cuts down on the uh, insect, insect population. And then, like I just said, the uh, air circulation in the canopy, and then less cold damage and dieback in the winter. And we are right now seeing considerable dieback on crepe myrtles due to the cold last week uh, across the South Central United States. And uh, one thing I see a lot in Louisiana now is, of course, the topping of the crepe myrtle trees and people are doing this earlier. So used to, if crepe myrtles were pruned, they were pruned in January or February. Now I'm seeing crepe myrtles being pruned in September, October. And if they're topped in September, October, they produce a month or two of new stem growth, of new foliage growth. And then that new growth is more susceptible to die back by cold. So we really need to, to get into the middle of winter to do our pruning on our crepe myrtle trees and do the, uh, and do the thinning. So that's the uh, classic image of a crepe myrtle tree with the branches on the left before it's pruned and on the uh, right after it's pruned. And you can see that you're not reducing the height. Uh, you could take off those seed pods if you wanted to, but it's not necessary. You're taking out that small twiggy growth. You're taking out those branches that are competing with each other. Uh, that's gonna help the sunlight penetration. That's gonna help the air circulation. And you can see through the tree. When you look into the canopy of the tree, you wanna be able to see through the tree. Whereas the tree on the left, you cannot see through that canopy uh, nearly as good as you see through the canopy on the, uh, on the right. It takes more art and science and thought to prune a crepe myrtle by thinning as it does, than it does by topping. But uh, we'll try to take the time to do the thinning instead of the topping. And that's a, a nice, beautiful uh, semi-dwarf 15-foot crepe myrtle at the uh, horticulture building on the LSU campus in Baton Rouge. A little bit out of focus, but that tree has been pruned into a nice um, multiple trunk tree. You can see there's not a lot of small wood there in the, in the canopy as you start getting up into the foliage. You have about 50 to 60% of the height of the tree clear trunk on the bottom and then you have about 40 to 50 percent of the tree with the major lateral branches and the flowers up top. So that's really what a nice crepe myrtle tree will look like. You can still have a view there. You can see underneath the tree. Um, so um, I really think that tree uh, has turned out a very nice. And that pruning is by Alan Owings, by the way. Okay. Okay, and here are some of the uh, crepe murder uh, disasters uh, from across the South. I do a lot of pictures on these and uh, I won't show too many today because it gets everybody all worked up. But, uh, um, but uh, these, uh, these crepe myrtles are basically uh, topped every year. And you can see all those uh, uh, branches at the top, almost a witch's broom kind of growth habit to it. You have so many stubs there, you're gonna have so much vegetative growth coming out of there. You're not gonna have any air circulation there, sunlight in there. You're gonna have excessive competition. Uh, all that area is also is very conducive to crepe myrtle bark scale insects getting into there and, and overwintering very well in a crepe myrtle that's been topped like that. So let's try to get away from this kind of uh, crepe myrtle pruning. But this picture is one from my uh, landscape friend, Taylor Williams. He, he uh, does a lot of landscaping in New Orleans. So uh, this actually won the Southern Living Magazine's Crate Murder Photo Contest two years ago. Southern Living Magazine actually has a contest where people send in pictures of their murdered 
crepe myrtle trees and and uh, and they declare winter. So, you know, we have the, the white limestone rock down there at the base, and then you have the red lava rock, and then you have your galvanized steel tub uh, there that has been welded together around the base of the tree. And then you put your some more limestone rock in there, and then you and then you top it last year, and then you come back and top it this year, six inches above where you topped it uh, last year. And then you have the ADT security sign uh, in the left where that, that uh, security obviously did not protect the crepe myrtle tree. And then you have the New Orleans Inspire Hydrant in the back and the stop sign. So I just thought this was a very good uh, uh, photo and it's always uh, fun and entertaining to, to show that. And this is the, uh, some of the pictures from Dr. Alan Wyndham in Tennessee. And you can see this is a, a top crepe myrtle and uh, that, that's had some uh, pruning paint and a wound sealer put on it. Uh, but those uh, cuts are not healing properly. And then you actually have dead wood in there. Uh, Schizophyllum is, is the one of the funguses that, that causes this problem. So actually this trunk right here, it's not producing any new growth. Whereas the trunks in the back are still looking pretty decent and actually producing some new growth still. So in the same tree, you may have one trunk doing good and another trunk or two uh, doing poorly. And here's the, uh, here's the fungus, here's the mushrooms uh, growing on the uh, outside of the trunk. You have some splitting going on there. You have bark sloughing. Uh, also trees like this, we're finding a lot of armillaria root rot getting started in them. So armillaria is another major fungus that is causing this issue. So a schizophyllum and armillaria, there's really nothing you can do once your trees start having these kind of uh, fungus, uh, fungus problems. Okay, shrub pruning, uh, there's really no rules that cover all pruning in regard to shrubs. Uh, we need to, um, um, you know, what time of year to prune? Are we gonna prune these shrubs once a year or twice a year or three times a year? Or do they need to be pruned every year? If we are gonna prune, we wanna prune lightly and more often. Um, I do find sometimes that, that you know, people, uh, hedge their boxwoods and their dwarf yew ponds way too often. We need to allow for growth between prunings. And also if we get to June and we have uh, dry weather and we have three to four weeks of 95 degree temperatures coming, that's not the time to get uh, this kind of pruning done. So we need to watch the weather and look at the health of the plant, look at the growth of the plant, and we don't need to be pruning on a schedule. We need to be pruning based on what we're trying to accomplish and how the plant is, is responding to the environmental conditions at the particular time that we're, uh, that we're going out there to prune. Um, many times on your shrub pruning, we are pruning to control the size and the shape because we sometimes do have too many plants in too small of an area in a landscape bed. And then, um, you know, you have abelias and lower petalums and, and sunshine ligustrums that get bigger than we think they're going to get. So you have to regularly shape them and prune them to keep the size a little bit under control. Uh, we talked about the bypass shoots on the azaleas. You know, azalea plants, especially the more vigorous growing ones, will kind of have those, uh, those shoots that kind of bypass the rest of the plant canopy. Uh, that may be six to 12 inches above the main part of the canopy. I like to go into the, those plants once or twice a year and, and remove those shoots. Um, uh, normally when we're pruning shrubs, we're thinking about topping. Uh, we need to think about thinning. And then a lot of people don't prune their nandinas and their mahonias correctly. Uh, on your nandinas and mahonias, maybe once a year go in there as needed. And, and thin out your tallest growing cane or your tallest growing one or two canes. And you cut those off at the base, like six inches above the soil line. So you're basically just thinning out a trunk or thinning out a cane on those particular plants. And that kind of makes a whole lot better appearance than you, when you go in there and just top uh, uh, heavenly bamboo nandine or, 
old firehouse uh, fire um, um, fire uh, now I can't think of the name of it, but the uh, but the fire the red foliage uh, firepower in Andinas. Uh -huh. Of course, we want to prune based on uh, when the plants flower. Uh, and we need to realize, you know, which shrubs are blooming on older wood and which shrubs are blooming on newer wood. And, and there's always questions about hydrangeas and, you know, your garden hydrangeas bloom on older wood, but also some of the new endless summer varieties bloom on new wood too. So they bloom on old wood and new wood, whereas your hydrangea paniculatus like lime white, they bloom on new wood. So if you prune your hydrangeas, garden hydrangeas this time of year, you're gonna be affecting your flowers for this coming year. But if you prune down your limelight hydrangeas right now, you're not gonna affect your summer flowering because they're gonna put on spring growth and buds on the spring growth, and then they're gonna flower in early summer. So it all depends on what specific plant you're, uh, you're talking about. And then when you have the shrubs that bloom multiple times during the year, of course, the, uh, the multi-seasonal blooming uh, azaleas are the ones that come into mind the most. Uh, you wanna get your pruning done after the uh, spring bloom is finished and you have less time to get that pruning completed before you negatively impact the next flower bud development cycle, the next flowering cycle. So on a typical spring flowering azalea, you have till maybe the end of June to get that pruning done. But on a multi-seasonal blooming azalea, regardless of which series you're, you're working with, you only have about four weeks or so after that spring flowering is done to get that uh, pruning done before you negatively impact uh, the next flower cycle. So here's some uh, dwarf yopon hedges, and these are pruned uh, four to five times a year to keep that shape to them. Um, and that's, that's okay as long as you don't severe severely prune and you leave enough foliage there that you have enough leaf area for good photosynthesis. You don't want to be pruning back deep into this particular canopy because you'll take off too much of the, the leaf material at every pruning and you'll be stressing the plant. So you got to leave enough area there for the photosynthesis to occur. And then here's some sunshine ligustrums in Baton Rouge. And this is a winter picture. So the sunshine ligustrums are not as sunny and yellowy as they, uh, as they normally are. And I imagine there's a lot of cold damage on these in Texas right now. But you can see these have the bypass shoots that have about 12 inches of new shoot growth above the main body of the canopy. So you want to uh, prune those out a few times a year and keep the plants a little bit more tidy and, uh, and nice looking. And here's the, uh, the bypass shoots on one of the uh, Encore azaleas. Uh, this picture was taken at the Mississippi State Experiment Station in Poplarville. So uh, uh, it'll be nice to go in here and tidy up this azalea and take off uh, uh, some of these uh, bypass shoots that are kind of uh, hovering above the rest of the uh, plant canopy here. Okay, I'm certainly not the, uh, oh, I thought this was gonna be a weed slide. So here's the, here's the mulching slide, okay. Mulching, we all know what the uh, advantages of mulching are. Um, we wanna go out with mulch. We don't wanna go up with mulch. The tendency now is everybody wants to seem to go up with their mulch around the trees and the shrubs. And we need to go out with our mulch around our trees and the shrubs. Uh, one to two inches of mulch on your bedding plants and herbaceous perennials. Uh, two to three inches on your shrubs, uh, three to four inches on your trees. Keep the area around your uh, main trunk uh, clear of the uh, mulch. But here's all the positive attributes that mulching does uh, help with. Uh, have a good layer of mulch put out on your landscape plantings in early spring, and then kind of refresh the mulch in late summer, early fall. Usually new mulch can go on top of old mulch and, uh, and there's many different mulch materials that are, people are using there. Just make sure you're not layering too much and, and adding too uh, deep of a layer of mulch and not, aren't getting excessive buildup of mulch um, and, and just go on that 
stair step uh, method to get to the height that you need. But really mulch will do a very good job on weed suppression if you, uh, if you put it out correctly and kind of maintain the area. Here's the uh, Texas A&M Forestry Service uh, 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 image from a few years back about uh, how we ought to mulch a tree. And uh, there's the bottom right, of course, is the, is the mulch going out. And we're not supposed to be doing this, by the way, our friends think it should look, or our parents think it should look, or our neighbors think it should look, or society thinks it should look or how I thought it should look. It should look like that last picture out and not up, okay? I actually, sometimes when I go to the grocery store, or go to a restaurant and I see this, I kind of get my hand trial out and I kind of pull some of that bark off the main trunk. And if you pull some of that bark off the main trunk there and put your hand on the bark and feel how hot it is, and, and, and you know, you're heating up that trunk, you're keeping, more moisture around that trunk and you're just bringing in the possibility uh, for problems there. Uh, of course, in South Louisiana, we have a lot of live oaks and there's a tendency to, you know, if you have a live oak and it's kind of, you know, stagnant or not growing good, well, let's just mulch it. Okay, well, well that's fine. And that will help sometimes in rehabilitating or, or preserving a live oak to get it to live longer, but this is in combination with aeration and and maybe a little bit of a liquid feed injection around the uh, around the drip line. And you can see this is nicely done by one of the tree companies in New Orleans. And this is a nice uh, um, uh, partially aged, but certainly not fully composted composted um, a bark mulch there. And you can see they've kept the uh, the uh, mulch off of the main base of the tree and they've gone out about half about 10 feet from the main trunk and they could go out further if they wanted to but this this uh, does look nice and it is is uh, it is helping the uh, the tree in this particular uh, situation okay and then the main thing is mulching improperly and we already talked about some of this so basically when you put too much mulch out you're basically simulating uh, planting a plant too deep. Uh, you may be affecting the phloem tissue. Uh, uh, you're starving the roots. You're bringing in fungal and bacteria infection. Um, um, you know, heat buildup. Um, you're making an area where fire ant mounds can, can uh, kind of get established. Uh, you may bring in termites. Now y'all don't have maybe as many termite problems in Texas as we do in Louisiana, but you all do have termite issues. So really be careful with your mulch material and be aware that if you have some wood out there that you're using as mulch, you may have a termite uh, problem uh, move in on you. And this is the classic over mulching of crepe myrtle trees. And uh, you can see um, here you have kind of a bare ground, a roundup circle that you're keeping the turf grass off and then somebody has put too much mulch around the base of this crepe myrtle, it'd be better to go ahead and bring all that mulch out to the, to the edge of where the, uh, to, and bring it out and meet the turf grass. So uh, it doesn't make sense to, to see something like this um, uh, done. Guess my blood pressure going up too. Okay, weed issues. I'm sure I'm sure we've had a few weed talks at the Aggie chat sessions, but uh, just a reminder that uh, just like bedding plants and other plants, there's cool season weeds and there's warm season weeds. Now, Texas, you all have a big geographical climate area, so you know cool season weeds. Uh, they they start in September and they go all the way till May, and then your warm season weeds they start in end of January 1st of February down in South Texas and they go all the way till Thanksgiving. So you have eight to nine months, nine to 10 months of cool season weeds and then the same length of time for warm season weeds. And you have those two or three month periods in the spring and two or three month periods in the fall where you have both of those weeds. So we need to be aware of what weeds we're looking at right now. And we need to be able to differentiate between the grassy weeds and the broadleaf weeds and the sedges and the Kalinga. 
And there's a lot of good weed control products out there right now, but it's just realizing um, that you need to put pre-emerge out probably three times a year. Uh, don't let the weeds get ahead of you. Um, you want to time your pre-emerge herbicide with the time that the weeds see germinate. So we have in the late winter, February, we start getting the warm season weeds germinating. So, you know, pre-emerge February into early March is when we need to put that out in most geographical areas of Texas, I believe. But then we have some warm season weeds that don't germinate first thing. They germinate later in the spring. And that's usually late April, early May, chamber bitter, spurge, uh, some of those that are more difficult to control, Lespedeza. And those, those seem to kind of escape because we forget that we need to put out a second pre-emerge application later in the spring. So late April, early May, put it out again. And then you put it out in September, October to try to take care of your early germinating uh, fall weeds so, or cool season weeds. So this is a good three times a year for a commercial landscape company to use. And like a nursery growing situation at Bracey's Nursery, we put out pre-emerge five times a year. So it just depends on your particular operation and, and, and what your weed pressure is and what your weeds are and uh, and make a, a judgment uh, decision on uh, when you need to do that. Um, okay, we need to wrap things up pretty soon. Uh, I already talked about uh, these insect issues when we were um, here last time. And basically, I just wanted to encourage everybody that we need to make sure we, we uh, properly identify our insect problems. Um, still seeing issues where people don't know exactly what insect it is, but they know there's an insect there. So what can we use to control it? Uh, what time of year is it most controllable? Um, whether it be crape myrtle bark scale or whether it be putting out bait for fire ants or whether it be uh, azalea or lantana lace bugs or whether it be scale T scale on our camellias or on our magnolias or Florida wax scale on our hollies. We need to have the right timing to to get these uh, pests uh, managed. And we need to know what our preventive application rate is and what our control application rate is. Uh, if we're a commercial landscape company and we're applying products in a residential area uh, and your client um, um, is involved with you about what goes on in his or her particular property, uh, they may want you to use an organic insecticide option. So you need to kind of figure all these things out and keep in mind what the beneficial insects are, what the harmful ones are, what the insect life cycle is, and uh, et cetera. And uh, you know, you can maybe put some monitoring traps out there and, and help you uh, find out uh, what you have going on. So uh, aphids, uh, aphids causing the uh, black city mold on the crepe myrtle trees seems to be problematic every year. Uh, if, if you're maintaining a property, you should know, you know, what insects are going to be issues at what time of the year. So we all know that aphids are going to get on crepe myrtle trees um, in April. And, um, and they're going to cause um, uh, sooty mold issues like white flies will if we don't uh, get those under control. Azalea lace bugs is a very heavy population when you get that much uh, visual uh, symptoms on the, on the foliage. Uh, you know you have a very severe azalea a lace bug issue. And these are probably getting active right now, even as, as cold as it was last week. I'm certainly not an entomologist, but we do need to be watching our azaleas late winter, early spring every year for the azalea lace bug populations and, uh, and watch these before they get to be um, this, uh, this kind of a population that gets you a lot of uh, uh, damage out there before you notice what's going on. And azaleas that are in full sun, azaleas that have reflective heat around them, azaleas that are stressed, they're going to have more 
lace bugs susceptibility to them than azaleas that are in a little bit of shade, azaleas that are well watered, as opposed to azaleas that are dried out or a little bit on the dry side. So keep in mind those kind of things. The, uh, the azalea, camellia, and gardenia care, and basically these are acid-loving plants, and I guess that's why I wanted to, to put this information up here, so you know, might, may want to take a picture of this slide, but, uh, but you know, just acid-loving plants, uh, we need to keep these things in mind, and a lot of Texas does not have acid soil. Northeast Texas, the piney woods of East Texas, of course, has favorable conditions for these plants, but then when you get into uh, other areas of the state, you have more problems with azaleas, gardenias, and camellias. So know your soil, know your pH, um, and, um, and kind of monitor for these insect issues, and, um, and keep in mind just proper uh, cultural care to, to get your azaleas and camellias and gardenias to do their best. Okay, just getting toward the end here, uh, just a very simple a slide here showing the proper planting of a tree. The general rule is that we don't want to um, um, put compost or pine bark or another material back in the hole. We basically want a backfill with the same that came out of the planting hole. Now, when we get to maybe a 200 gallon or a 300 gallon tree, depending on how that tree was grown, and what kind of media or soil is in that root ball presently versus the amount, the soil that's being planted into, we may do some amendments in that kind of situation. But a typical two inch bald and burlap tree, seven, 15 gallon, 30 gallon tree, typically the, the backfill soil ought to be uh, the same soil that was dug out of the planting hole and we shouldn't be doing amendments uh, to that soil. You don't want to be changing the texture uh, of the soil and the planting hole compared to the soil outside the planting hole because you can have, uh, you know, air and water exchange uh, possibilities and, and problems there when you do a lot of modification of that, uh, of that planting area. And then on your, I uh, want to remind everybody to, to get uh, Texas a and to do some water quality and soil testing for you. I believe the water quality test at the Texas A&M Soil Lab is $25. Uh, I'm not positive, I think that's right. But you wanna know what your pH is of your water, iron content, which is, can be a problem in the irrigation systems. Do you have a sodium issue? Do you have enough calcium and magnesium to offset your sodium problems? Um, the um, um, so, you know, bedding plants, greenhouse growers, but also landscapers, especially those of y'all who are landscaping and, and using the municipal water for irrigation. A lot of times municipal water supplies do have a high pH, have high alkalinity, have sodium in them. So in dry years where we're dependent on irrigation water and not so much rainfall, you can have issues with um, water quality uh, causing uh, nutritional deficiencies on, uh, on some of your bedding plants and your acid loving plants. And then uh, we really need to know our soil texture also, and we need to know soil pH and you know whether we need to use lime or whether we use, need to use a soil for product to get your soil pH under control. Usually on your soil testing, you want um, about six to eight times the calcium to one part magnesium. So a six to eight calcium to magnesium ratio. Uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are your primary macronutrients. And then your calcium, magnesium, and sulfur are your uh, secondary macronutrients. And then you have your micronutrients there too. And when your soil pH is not right, your micronutrients can be a pretty uh, majorly affected. So so uh, always important to soil test. If you have a new planting site, make sure your soil test. Uh, if you have a planting site that you do some corrective um, uh, soil treatments to to get the pH right or the nutrients right, you want to retest in six months, 12 months, to see if those adjustments made a, uh, made a difference. So, um, so very important on getting your plants growing right to have the right soil pH there 
and the right uh, nutrient uh, status. So don't overlook that. And then that's some of the, the, the buzzwords that I leave with encouraging folks to soil test. We want to plant something. Dr. David Creech says, keep planting. Uh, Greg Grant says, we want to stop the crap and save the crepes. Remember that you cannot plant your flowers if you're not botany, botany, bot any. Uh, we want to go grow. Y'all know how we spell go and grow in Louisiana. We never want to get caught with our plants down. We want to have green side up. And whether you overwater your plants or underwater your plants, once they're dead, they all look the same. So that's some buzzwords that y'all can use for your elevator uh, horticulture humor. So I hope y'all enjoyed that. And I know that was very fast and not thoroughly in depth, but kind of covered a lot of topics. And maybe you all picked a couple of things to, uh, to think about as you uh, get landscaping this spring and can use some of these things to help you with your your client uh, relationship. So thank you all. Really good to be with uh, with y'all at Texas A&M Maggie Chat again today. Thank you, Dr. Owens. That's uh, that's quite a, a presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope I stayed on time. I wasn't sure how long we we're supposed to go. I thought one o'clock or so. Yeah, you know, you, this is perfect. This is perfect. Uh, we normally go for about a, a, an hour, uh, okay. you know, so yeah, so 12, uh, 12, 12 to about 1, 12. But this is this is perfect. And that leaves some, uh, you know, leaves us, leaves us some uh, time for uh, questions and stuff. Um, I, I want to share one of uh, uh, Laura Laura's uh, comment on the uh, sunshine lagustrums. Uh, Laura said the sunshine lagustrum is suffering from SAD around here, and I didn't know what SAD. I know what sad is. I don't trying know to what think what that may be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Laura said uh, it's seasonal affective disorder. <laughs> so, that's, uh, the, that's the, la the last two years, Laura, I've had, you know, a lot of people ask me just about the winter look on sunshine and how it looks kind of yellow. I mean, looks kind of brown and defoliated and, you know, yeah. So, but when it, but when it's gorgeous in June, it looks so nice. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll if, see if you're into that, if you're into that color plant, which I like. You know? Right. Well, we'll see how it does. Uh, all of our ligustrums, um, even just the, you know, regular chinins looks pretty bad so i think i think we've got laura Pedalums look really bad i think we've got some some challenges this year and getting things looking good so it's, it's gonna be interesting to see how long it takes some of these plants to grow out of it and which ones are going to grow out of it and People want to see a result within the next couple of weeks and this will be midsummer y'all it's not You're right it's, it's gonna be a long term thing We've all got to be patient, so that's right. I think the snow coverage may have helped a little bit in some areas. Should, uh, yes, definitely. And I think, you know, especially when we've been talking about this quite a bit with turf grass or, you know, things that were actually on the ground and covered, but when you've got a fairly big shrub, it's not, I don't know how much it helps. Right. My brother lives in Longview, Texas, and he has St. Augustine grass. And I was thinking about that. Now, they had a lot of snow on the ground, though, in, in Longview. And then I noticed Neil Sperry in one of his emails, he said something about St. Augustine or how when we've had this kind of weather in Texas, St. Augustine lawns have really uh, suffered a lot. So I want to see, you know, how they have come through. after sure. Alan. Alan, are you going to join us maybe tomorrow, 4 p.m., the, the winter plant recovery? for? I, 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 re I register for that. Um, I've got to go to Bracey's in the morning, and then I have a lunch meeting in Baton Rouge. If I get <laughs> if I get to where I can be on the phone, uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, be there. Yeah, I, may be we, on the phone. I may be on the phone, though, instead of on the computer. That, that sounds fine. If we could, you know, get your attention, get you to answer some of the questions that, you know, we may, uh, we, 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 yeah, we could use a lot of help. We could use a lot of help. Uh, what are y'all seeing on roses, like knockouts and drift roses? Oh. Or is it too early to? to I think it's that? way too early to tell on those. And my big question is going to be, um, you know, normally we prune around the middle of February. So we've got pruned and unpruned. 
you know, and, and how are those going to react? So, um, well, we've got, we've got some, uh, like, especially in North Louisiana, we've got, you know, roses that are showing a good bit of dieback already. And I've been telling people they ought to wait at least two weeks to do yeah. their February rose pruning, although that'll put us till March 10th or March 15th. But theirs will still be more dieback after that initial dieback. And we need to see how far right. down, how far down the canes that's going to go. Exactly. I think this is one of those times when it really pays to procrastinate. So if you didn't prune, that's good. You know, you've got, you, it, it kind of probably improved your outcome. And I, I have some peaches that I did that I hadn't pruned yet. So I'm, you know, going to wait a while on those. Laura, that's not called a procrastinate. That's called strategically delaying. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it's strategically uh, doing it. So uh, I, I appreciate Airfong has already uh, uh, put in the chat uh, the information for our uh, next, you know, it, it's tomorrow, you know, for our next uh, um uh, meeting uh, our chat so tomorrow's chat 4 p.m is going to be our chat on winter plant recovery and focusing on the backyard edition so this is uh, similar to the one that we did last thursday but last thursday the one we did was focusing on the green industry and tomorrow it's going to be uh, focusing on the uh, the hobbyists and landscapes and feel free to forward that registration link to your clientele you know, because sometimes they, uh, you know, they may want to, to do a quick uh, cleanup or something, but sometimes it may pay, you know, in the long run to, to just, just like we were being talking about, you know, strategically delaying any action that, uh, you know, that, that we may just kind of uh, the knee jerk reaction just to do something, you know, just to do something. And also the recording, all the previous, uh, chat with green aggies including today's you know it's available on the youtube channel and airphone has already put the link there um so and and also we would uh, appreciate you if you could uh, fill out the survey and dr becky ballin already put on the survey link there for your convenience so we uh, uh, really appreciate your input uh you know that helps us to you know justify the way uh, we do these chat with the green aggies and of of course you know the directions uh, where you guys would like to you know to to see uh, that you know see us doing so uh, any other things panelists that y'all want to add Erfan, is that a new panelist for chat with green aggies <laughs> yeah this is the newest panelist uh, it's approaching his nap time so he's not gonna, he's gonna be relatively quiet at the moment but yeah <laughs> oh he likes to somehow just just Finds his way into this back office uh, every once in a while and just wants up on my lap. He's gravitating toward all of the plant nerdiness. Yes. Yeah. Really going to well be it. Well, again, and there's a there's a yes. couple questions. Uh, Go ahead, uh, Doctor Gu, about you know on the topping and you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's another form, there's a less severe form of topping, which people call heading back, yes. where you can kind of gradually bring the height down a little bit, just find those taller shoots and bring them back to where they uh, come in contact with another branch. So you're doing a, a modified height reduction and uh, that's certainly more favorable to do a heading back kind of cut. So sometimes it's hard to explain what we're saying when we talk about heading back, but that's that's a um, horticulturally more acceptable uh, method to <laughs> pursue. <laughs> Horticulture, is it horticulturally uh, more acceptable or horticulturally uh, less <laughs> destructible? <laughs> yeah, and everybody says, well, we do all this pollarding in Europe, so why can't we do it here, you know, but you know. Uh, I think we may have a slightly different, just a slightly different, uh, um, you know, the, the aesthetic value, you know, slightly different from what they have there in Europe. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the, na the natural form uh, versus the, the very structured, yeah, in a very structured form. <laughs> so, all right, well. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Owens. This is really has been a pleasure and always learn something from uh, listening to you. Uh, I really enjoyed it and enjoy, uh, well, and also appreciate everyone's attention to today's uh, chat with the Aggies. With Good to that, see you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Right. Have a great afternoon. Okay. Thanks. Get back to meeting in person so you can bring me a donut. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, totally. Totally. You wouldn't believe, Alan, you wouldn't believe the uh, the car line, the um, the car line in our uh, recently newly opened uh, donut shop, which is very close to where uh, Dr. Dan Leinberger Mm -hmm. lives i mean it's just crazy the the <laughs> i'm serious it's it goes all the way on the uh on wellborn i mean for so long and and it's just like anytime anytime like <laughs> mid morning late afternoon that people are you know their cars are lining up on the drive through you know the drive through line just uh waiting for the for the uh donuts. man my donut place closes at 11 a.m I'm, I'm gonna have to check that out 24 hour donuts. That's <laughs> it's almost 24 hour donuts. Well, you know, uh, we uh, work hard here uh, in Texas. We work really <laughs> We need our around the clock donuts. <laughs> we, we need around the for the for the sugar for the sugar. Y'all, y'all, let me know if y'all ever get back to having regional Texas Nursery Landscape Association meetings too. Yes, yes. We'd well, love to have you over. It would mm -hmm. be great. Yes. Oh, I will uh, definitely take you up on that. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. I don't know who meets where, and I never find out about it till a day or two. Before. <laughs> well, Alan, um, uh, I could well I could probably uh, keep you informed in the way. So uh, okay. I mean, okay. yeah, we'd we'll love to have you join us. Uh, you know, see you in those in those meetings. 